Welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am with Martin Banana Head Willis. Banana Head, where did you get that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a, a new phrase for me. I've never heard that one before, and I learned it from you. I won't say who you called a banana head. Um, it's no one the listeners know, I don't think, but uh, so don't be... Don't think it was like, you know, Nick Pope or something, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) it was something else. But I just thought it was a very cute phrase. And, uh, you know, I've gotten a couple of suggestions, too, as to what to call you recently. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if I want to hear them. Or you just spring spring them on me when, you know, mm -hmm. when the time is right. Well, I don't even remember. Actually, lucky for you, I, I can't remember. I was trying to remember uh, this time. But one of them, last time I used it, was Martin, what you talking about, Willis. That was That's actually right. a listener suggestion. Wow. Yes. That's cute. <laughs> I and I met that Gary one. Coleman. Yeah. Yes, I do get that one. A lot of uh, idea. Occasionally people will say yeah. that to me. Yeah. So that phrase was used by Gary Coleman, and I met him. Did I tell you about that? Yeah. Yeah, so I remember. Yeah, cool. after you told me, after you called me that, yeah. Oh, I did. Did tell okay. me. Yeah. Oh man. Poor People Gary Coleman. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Funny little fella. He and he is so little. But uh, yeah, so cool stuff. So I've been gone, and I'm back. Of course, Martin, you're here with the news, and we're going to talk about some UFO stuff. But uh, first, I want to tell people about my guest. You ready oh, for this? Good. Yes. You sure? I'm ready, yes. There is no guest. It's just going to be me and you blabbing our for the for, for a little bit here. Did I know that? I think I you did. I, I don't know if I knew that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you didn't know that. Oh, my God. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. Hopefully you I'll got wing the time. it, man. Yeah, we'll wing it because I want to share, you know, what I've been up to the last couple of weeks. I'm sure people, you know, they always get annoyed when we don't have a show for a couple of weeks, and uh, which is great. I'm, I'm happy that people um, pay attention and, and love the show. But uh, I've gotten some inform. And not only, you know, did I have fun it, and I could share what my trip was about, but I got some interesting information regarding space and regarding UFOs. That is coincidental and crazy and wild and and fun. And uh, so I think people will like this. So we'll talk about all of that. And we'll talk about some recent UFO news that uh, maybe you brought a couple pieces of news. That would be great. Did you? Well, I I got one that's that's up on your site. Okay, Would you like me to discuss that now? Something that I posted this morning? Uh, No. Oh, okay. A, A little while ago. Okay, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Let's get into some UFO news. Well, and it's also not, uh, it didn't happen recently. But anyway, oh. this is about, I, I think it's interesting because I love illustrated um, UFO sightings. And this one is about a, a black flying disc UFO with blue lights spotted in New Mexico. <laughs> uh, this is in Ruidoso, uh, New Mexico. Ruidoso. Which, Rui Doso. Here, copy yeah. me. Oh, you said it pretty rare. Rui Doso. Rui Doso. And I drive through that when I go from here to Roswell. Yes. Well, it's about, it's right in between Las Cruces and Albuquerque. So it's yeah. about, yeah, three mo- three hours south of Albuquerque and about two hours to the north, uh, north. East, I guess, of Las Cruces. Yeah, beautiful. So right in between, and it's actually beautiful. I've looked at I looked at some mm-hmm. pictures online. It is it's, pretty, uh, and I love the name, so that's why I always remember driving through there. 
Right, right. Well, this uh, sighting actually happened all the way back in uh, about 2013 in August. Uh, it was reported, however, just recently on Thanksgiving Day. And so the witness had drawn some great uh, illustrations. And what I like about this sighting, I like unusual sightings, and this one is unusual because what he saw was a black disc. And uh, right around the rim on the edges, there were little blue lights, um, which, you know, made me think, well, maybe it was some type of drone or something, but I don't know. Um, it, it, you don't hear of too many, um, well, you don't hear of any drones with blue lights around them, really, to speak of. But um, but our UFO sightings, you, I think this is actually the first one I've heard with blue lights all the way around it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, um, he was walking, you know, basically walking along um, when he saw this, and um, then he just drew these great little drawings. So if you go to your website, which is openminds.tv, uh, uh, you will see these drawings, uh, crayon drawings, actually, but uh, but pretty well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so pretty interesting. So we saw it from a side view, and then from a from directly below and it was circular it looked like it was a circular thing um yeah really weird it is kind of a weird one and it's great that they drew pictures and uh with crayons right yeah i don't think i'd want that thing hovering over me yeah uh, that's weird yeah well, but they did such a great I job like with it. the pictures and it, it, it this whole adult coloring thing is kind of funny i like that you like they the probably whole- just went in their kids a crayon box and yeah, rated it, and uh, but you can tell it's a good, steady hand. But it's a thing now: coloring books Is for really? adults. You haven't heard about that? No. Yeah, they've maybe got, I should get into it. Yeah, if you go oh. to the bookstores, uh, my sister and my mom have gotten into it. But there's this whole thing: coloring books for adults. Wow, which is I, kind of funny. Be, yeah. I bet that's like stress relieving. Mm -hmm. In my trip last week, and I'll talk more about this, that's one of the things they gave us was a coloring book with some (laughs) uh, color pencils, uh, a NASA coloring book as as a gift. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And did you do do your coloring? No. I'm going to give it to my mom because she's into uh, doing that. So I figured I'll give it to her and she can color make to a, her heart's content make a nice christmas present yeah yeah so yeah interesting sighting these sightings are always fun new mexico is a really interesting place ruidoso is a really pretty interesting place it's fun because you know on on the leg of the trip to roswell that's and, and i used to do that a lot you know driving here to roswell luckily last couple of years i've flown and hopefully this next year i'll fly again but um you get it, it's ugly, boring desert until you get to Las Cruces, which is gr- gorgeous. And then when you get over the hills over Las Cruces, there's the white, uh, the the range, the White Sands Missile Range with uh, um, missile parks here and there, which are really cool. So you can see all these rockets and everything. And then from there, you drive through this really pretty country up into the hills, and you, you're pretty much in mountainous area until you get to this. Desert Plains of Roswell, which again, then it gets boring <laughs> until you get to Roswell. But until then, it's just super pretty. You're driving through like an Apache reservation and stuff like mm. that. And it's just gorgeous area. So at least once, if you haven't done it, you know, driving to Roswell, especially from the west, the western side of the country is a lot of fun. Or driving around the area. And I highly recommend for people to go go out to Roswell, uh, the Carlsbad Caverns. You ever been there? Mm, no, I've always wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Super, super cool. So let's see, out I'm, of the headlines, since we're talking about UFO news right now, uh, there were a couple of headlines from this morning. I, I don't know that I missed a whole lot. Uh, were, I mean, are you aware of any big stories in the last couple of weeks? Not really. I have looked on the different sites just to see what's going on. Triangle... Um, sightings are seem to be kind of prevalent, but uh, um, nothing that really stands out in any particular way. Although there was like a, a totally red triangle, which I think is another unusual one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the stories that's out there is the these lights in Colorado. 
and they turned out to be military aircraft. But surprisingly, mm. uh, since I've posted that story this morning, a lot of people are not buying this military aircraft explanation. In the video, you do see kind of a row of lights, and they're kind of blinking and stuff like this. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that are doubting this official um, explanation of these lights with some pretty uh, interesting video. And it could be that they saw the video and they loved it and they thought it was so cool that they, they figured there's no way that's an aircraft. And then now they're coming out and saying it is an aircraft. But uh, yeah, Colorado, you can. that's a bigger story out there. Have you seen that video? I have not. Now, do you actually see the, what do they call them, the running lights or whatever? Do you see those blinking? No, not really. You just see the singular kind of lights. Um, mm. I haven't looked at it too closely, to be honest. But uh, Because there are, uh, there's actually laws, um, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure that you have to have no. those. Uh, you don't. Not if you're a military aircraft over a uh, military training area. Oh, sure. And Colorado is packed full of military. All of the Southwest. I mean, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, California, especially Southern California. Nevada, of course, is there's so much military and military proving grounds um, Hmm. that, yeah, there's a lot of... It could be that all of those states are also, you know, really high for UFO sightings. Uh, even mm. per capita, like we've talked about recently. And that's probably one of the reasons all of these military proving grounds. I know huh. stuff okay. they do out there, out here, is getting mistaken a lot. And that's one of the reasons I know they run lights off here at Goldwater often. Um, so there's jets flying around, dropping flares, but they have no visible lights on. They have what they call oh. their... I forget what they call it. Something like stealth mode or something where they're just using IR lights. So the pilots and stuff have, and, and the people on the ground have night vision goggles, and they can see the lights using their goggles but not using uh, their naked eye. Wow. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this is an interesting factoid. You want a little nerdy geekoid factoid? Oh, yes, absolutely. So I don't know if you've ever done this. So... IR, infrared, is like beyond what the eye can see. It's a frequency Mm -hmm. the eye can't see. Our remote controllers use that frequency to control our televisions and stuff like that. Mm. Well, in some of the older digital cameras, they didn't um, filter out that light. So if you were to videotape, like let's say with your Sony Hi8, a remote control and push the buttons, you would see the light. From that wow. remote control with your uh, old handy cam, uh, because uh, you something? know they didn't filter out that light. Kind of neat, huh? You'd see the light. I've seen the light. Seen the light. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's that's interesting. I know we can. Uh, I forget what the spectrum is that we can actually see, which you know calls into all kinds of things, um, even in regards to UFOs. You know, what we can see and what we can't see and what you can see with, you know, equipment. Mm. It's called human visible light frequency, HVLF. Wow. I I, didn't know you were so learned. I made that up, actually. Oh, wow. Sounds like a thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. So (laughs) another story, this is kind of interesting, and I'm going to look this up, is Nick Polk jacking with people i mentioned nick pope before he is uh a guy who used to in the 90s work for uh the ministry of defense investigating uh ufos in the uk while they did that of course that desk the ufo desk he used to work at was closed in 2008 and uh but he you know was convinced there's something really to the phenomena however lately he certainly has been expressing his um uh, distaste and uh, kind of with with hoaxers and people who believe in the hoaxes and the real goofy stuff and uh, and the UK tabloids of course like you and I talk about are really full of the goofy stuff oh. but he spoke with the sun um, which, of course, is a UK tabloid and is right. one of the, uh, you know, one of the people 
one of the tabloids that makes up a lot of sensational stuff. And, of course, if you go to these tabloids, they got all their bikini girls and everything all over the place and these weird stories. But uh, he wrote up a pretend classified document on what, you know, as if the government had a document on how we would deal with aliens should they invade and so the sun did a whole story on this with him and he talked about it now the sun although i make fun of him you know um there they do have a couple good writers there and uh, what's funny is uh, this trip i was recently on because one of the other tabloids that we kind of um beg on a bit is the daily mail or mail online is their online version i met a writer from mail online and talked with him quite a bit and uh yeah he gets embarrassed by some of the stories but uh mm. you know some of the writers are good and of course nick is great so it's an interesting story and he tweeted about this document here's what he tweeted he said here's the alien the alien invasion war plan that's generated recent media coverage. Don't pat it. Panic. I don't know why I can't talk today. Don't panic. It isn't a genuine government document or part of a sinister Illuminati plot. I drew it up to provoke an interesting, fun debate about the consequences of finding extraterrestrial life. And he attaches this document he made. And it's pretty funny because it's an alien invasion war plan with 10 points. And the 10th point says all information relating to this war plan is to be classified top secret. He has on the top of this document in red, top secret UK eyes only. And he has the same thing on the bottom. And it's signed Nick Pope, MJ12 UK J9. Banana head. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't really call him a banana head before the show, but you're calling him one now. He's being kind of a a banana head. Yeah. Mm. No, he's being a banana head on purpose, though. Yeah. So wow. isn't that funny? So yeah, so he's just kind of, uh, in a way, being ornery, but also uh, just having fun with uh, bringing forth this this uh, information. I wonder where that will go. You know, I mean, how many people take that seriously and and you know, uh, oh, you no, know, ride it out. Who knows? You know what? The people yeah. who will run with that and, and pretend or. or say that Nick is some sort of disinformation or government agent already are saying that. So yeah, I'm sure. And you know, another gentleman who is interested in this topic and is interviewed and talks about it quite a bit is another person who's accused of being part of a secret group that admin, you know, looks over UFOs like MJ 12. He's been accused of being part of MJ 12 is uh, John Alexander. So John, just thinking him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the same um, sense of humor that Nick Pope does. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's got a subtle one, but nothing, you know, like Nick's, uh, especially after a few drinks. Nick uh, can be hilarious. People might not know that about him. But if you go to a conference, you know, buy him a beer and hang out with him, especially into the wee hours of the morning, and you'll find this out about him. But um yeah, obviously he's showing a sense of humor here being really, really funny. But John Alexander does a lot of uh, analysis along those lines of, you know, what if aliens attacked sort of thing. And the gist of what Alexander says, and I think that's kind of Nick does that too in this document, it, the gist is that we're screwed. Uh. <laughs> if aliens attack, then you're over. Yeah. Well, logically, uh, that's uh, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, if yeah. they were able to get here, you know, what type of advanced, um, yeah. you know, technology would they have? That's why this whole theory of, or some of the theories that it's like this slow invasion or that they're just kind of doing some intelligence before they pounce type of stuff. It's kind of weird. Like they have done this for years because they wouldn't need to. Even if they wanted our yeah. resources, they could just kind of wipe us out and take them. They could build little robots instead of us ornery, you know, violent humans that just kind of screw things up. To So, I, I, yeah, so luckily it doesn't seem like that's at least a scenario that's playing out currently. I don't think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. 
So yeah, so those are a couple of stories on the headlines that are pretty interesting. Um, there's a lot about Apollo 17, which we'll get into as well, because that is very, very cool stuff. So do you have any more news stories? No, not really, but just kind of along those lines, I was speaking to a friend that didn't even know I did a UFO show. I talked to her, I don't know, once every three or four years or something like that. And she said something about, um, well, it's the aliens, you know, with this weather. I mean, she has a a boatyard in Puerto Rico. They just opened um, last summer. (laughs) It's completely wiped out. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, it's the aliens, you know. And I go, where are you coming up with that? She goes, well, I've always thought that they were just watching us. And and it's like, wow. So I told her I did a show. She's Now she's going to be a new listener to my show. But it's kind of funny how, um, you know, more people, I mean, I'm not saying anything of what she was saying is true or not true. I don't know. But um, it just seems more relaxed now. Have you noticed that? Like more people are are uh, accepting that there's a possibility that we are, you know, either being visited or... I think um, so. You know, like, for instance, this trip I just went on is a media trip where you spend it with a lot of other press. And it's not... It used to be a little more embarrassing or, or a little more, you know, you get a funny look when I talked about, you know, one of my main beats is UFOs. Um... Uh, when I just say the paranormal, it's not as big of a deal, but UFOs, especially with science people. And there are a couple people, especially my last trip, where one person was just like, ah, she's a science person. And she did that, you know, got very frustrated by the whole topic. But otherwise, other, it's mostly taken very positive. People seem to be mm-hmm. okay that you're interested in it. Um, yeah. I forget... The stages of acceptance. And I need to look into it. But it's essentially... Oh, here it is. Five stages of... Oh, grief. I don't want to Well, it's the same thing. (laughs) So this is like across the board of acceptance of something? Yeah, kind of a theory of acceptance. And... um, Hmm. They keep talking about five stages of grief, but this isn't grieving necessarily. But the point being that um, one of the first stages is uh, there's like a denial and then it's making fun of it. And then Mm -hmm. it's taken as self-evident. That's kind of the the way it goes. So uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle is pretty funny. He used to talk about, well, people would ask him, and, and this is why I remember this. If he feels frustrated that people make fun of this topic of UFOs and aliens and stuff. And he said, well, actually, because of these three stages, we've moved from denial to uh, ridicule. So he's very happy that we've moved on to another stage and moving closer to hmm. the, the next stage of uh taking it as self-evident. And it does feel as though we're moving into that stage, I feel like. Like, it's okay. It's just another thing. It's not as big of a deal. Maybe with all the other crazy beliefs that we've got going on out there right now, um, Flat Earth being so popular and some other stuff, um, you know, I, I agree with you. It seems like it's becoming more okay. It's flat and it's hollow at the same time. The Earth just is so- flat and oh, hollow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. That's kinda very like a, interesting. Yeah. Kind of like some type of cookie, you know. A hollow uh, cookie. With no filling. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Mm, cookies. <laughs> cookies are good. Can't say yeah. that too loud. My girlfriend's cookie crazy. Uh-oh. She's just talking mm. about cookies. She'll be like, where? Give me a cookie. <laughs> All right. So we've only got a few seconds and we'll go ahead and take our first break. Uh, for those of you listening on KGRA, you'll hear some commercials. Check out those commercials. Patronize these great people. They keep KGRA on the air, and what a great network it is. Otherwise, those of you that are listening on the podcast will hear a short musical interlude, and it will be very nice, cool, digital music. You're going to love it. You're going to just love it. So sit tight, and then we will be back with more. Alejandro and Martin on Open Mind UFO Radio.
Welcome back to Open Mind GFO Radio. You're listening to Alejandro Rojas, your host for this lovely little UFO show. And I am with Martin Banana Head Willis. In studio. Do you mind if I call you Banana Head? No. For the show? No, I think a lot of people would kind of agree with you, <laughs> unfortunately. So. I like bananas, too. Yeah. We got to see lots of bananas in Hawaii. So uh, I should say... Uh, I just wanted to to note this, which is kind of interesting. So you know how we, I talked about that uh, case with uh, in Colorado with uh, mm-hmm. the the plane, right. and they said it was a convoy of C seventeen aircraft. More and more people online are saying, "No, it's not. There's no way." So that's kind of funny. Um, you mean more people are posting since since we started? Yeah. Wow. So yeah. this has got people heated up, and they don't agree with that uh, C-17 explanation. So kind of interesting. I'll have to take a, a closer look at the video, and I uh, compel all of the listeners to do so as well. You can find that, of course, in the daily headlines at openminds.tv, or you can go to the Open Minds uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter and uh, and find that also, or mine also. So... Hawaii. I just want to mention it because I was I was there for a second, and I just wanted to say that you know we went on vacation for a week in Hawaii. No UFO activity, uh, unfortunately. It was cloudy most of the time, but we mm. did have a couple days of sun. But at an underwater adventure, we didn't see any USOs. Everything we saw was identified, but really cool stuff. I just wanted to let people know that. On my Facebook, if you look at the Alejandro Rojas, the public profile one, uh, even the other one, actually, if you look me up or on my Twitter, you'll, I posted a video of, so this is really cool. They have these submarines, and I remember when I was younger, they had these subs, you know, and I think uh, Disneyland had a ride where there's a, you get in a sub and go around and you see mermaids or whatever, mm-hmm. but you're not really submerged, you're the top of the sub is still above water, even though the bottom is underwater. But these are real subs that take you down like 100 feet. I think we got down to like 130 feet. And yeah, super cool. So we took one off of uh, at Waikiki Beach. It goes out into uh, not very far, you know, out uh, there. And there are sunken ships. There's planes and a couple sunken ships. And they sink them. Uh, one of them was sunken, I don't, I don't think on purpose, but the others were because they make like a, a coral reef, right. uh, because all of our coral reef is dying. And so they're sinking stuff for the yeah, for uh, fish, basically. Yeah, for fish mm-hmm. and, and the fish gather around these things in droves. So it's incredible to coast by without having to dive or, you know, be in scuba gear or anything coast by these wrecks and see all these fish. And in the video, I posted this giant, um, Turtle, sea turtle came swimming by. It was so cool. So uh, I, it was funny because being such a goofball. Uh, so we were at Oahu, which is where Waikiki is. Waikiki is in uh, Honolulu, the city of Honolulu. Honolulu is like mini Tokyo. It's mm. it's so many Japanese. There's there's lots of Asian people, but tons and tons of Japanese people. And it feels like you're in mini Tokyo because there's all these Japanese restaurants and people speaking Japanese and Japanese writing everywhere. There's a Tesla store. The Tesla store is full of these rich Japanese people probably shipping some Teslas home. But, you know, they have Japanese writing on everything, which is really fun because I love Japanese culture. I'm big into anime and all this other stuff. Um. So that was really interesting, really different that uh, the whole Japanese thing. But the, we were at Honolulu, and that's where we took this submarine ride. Um, but uh, the submarine thing was incredible, and you can check out the video. I don't now, know why like I went a- off on the Japanese thing. I was going to mention something <laughs> about it, but I can't remember now. Go ahead. Is that uh, was the Jap- I mean, was the submarine all glass, or how did you see so well so when you were in it? So you have these big portholes. Ah. Um, that are probably three feet wide, I think. Mm-hmm. Probably. Oh, this is what I was going to say. Is I've you know, there's the cliche idea about the Japanese tourists with their cameras and stuff, 
but that's mm-hmm. me when I travel. <laughs> I've got cameras, I've got my phone, I've got um, my GoPro, and you know when I take these oh, press trips, oh. it's because I want all of this media so I can put it out on social media. Uh, and also have some cool pictures, but I do that everywhere. So I was doing that there. So on the sub, I've got my GoPro pressed up against the gra- the glass of the porthole. And then in my hand, I have my DSLR and I'm trying to take pictures and get video with the DSLR uh, at the same time and trying to look. So I'm juggling all this stuff, changing lenses on my DSLR. I probably look pretty goofy. But I'm just so busy during when cool stuff is happening like this. But, you know, if you go look at my Instagram, you'll see some cool uh, videos of the parade. And I'm able to get some cool videos because when the turtle went by, luckily, I I had my GoPro and my DSLR running. And on the video, I posted both so you can see the difference. And uh, it's pretty cool. Did you actually see anything or were you filming the whole time? Both. (laughs) I could see stuff. Luckily, I know it's yeah. I know what it's like though. Mm-hmm. Like all of a sudden, you realize, well, hey, you know, I should be enjoying this instead exactly. of exactly filming. Yeah. Well, I don't, and that is kind of funny <laughs> because it's like, especially I, it gets so hectic. The time flies by, and I, I'm not so much enjoying, but I'm so stoked and happy with that I get it recorded because then I'm able to share with others, and then also. Um, uh, you know, r- look at the videos and pictures afterwards to remember the the wonderful times. Yeah, yeah that's great. Awesome. So really cool. I just wanted to mention that. But after that, I went to space camp. Um, so here's why. National Geographic. Uh, luckily, I've got some good buddies there in the promotions and, and marketing department. And um, they have this show, Mars. Uh, and we've talked about that because that's why I went to Hungary and I got to be on the set for the second season of this show, Mars. So they're promoting this show, Mars, and, and that's one of the reasons we got to go out there. And one of the actors was with us, um, Sammy. I forget his last name, but uh, cool dude. And then um, the scientist, or he's not a scientist. He's actually a journalist. He's a science writer. Uh, kind of mm. like some of us are there because most of the writers actually that go are entertainment and the, only a couple of us are science. Um, but he's a science writer who was a consultant and they based this Mars program off of his book, Stephen Petronek. So he was there. But the other show, I don't even know completely how much I can even sh- say about it because they really haven't announced much, much but I'll say some, um, is this w- show called One Strange Rock. Mm. And it looks super cool. So we got to talk with one of the directors and see some clips. And it's going to be a 10-part series uh, for National Geographic. And it's kind of like that show Earth on BBC, you know, that's that's a really mm-hmm. big deal where they get these cool footage and stuff like this of Earth. So it is based on getting this amazing footage. But it's from the perspective mostly of astronauts. So I have this really cool interview because we got to interview an astronaut. And I've interviewed Mike Massimo, who's also in this show, um, but on the same topic of what it's like, the the emotions and the experience of seeing the Earth from space and how all of these guys say it really changes them. Uh, Um, I'm sure. Often they use this term, spaceship earth because you get this idea of the size of the planet and that the planet is kind of this spaceship that's carrying us through space Mm -hmm. you know and it it makes it that much more important to them that we care for the environment of this spaceship i know when you look down at the atmosphere it's like the skin of an apple they say it's so so tiny Exactly. So it looks so fragile. It and, is fragile. Mm. And that's what we're finding out. It is, you know, how fragile it really is. So it's like, imagine, it's like your car, you know, or, you know, whatever vehicle. Um, if your car is a mess, you know, it's not that fun to be in. And it can be, you know, detrimental to you even being in there or or driving or something and it's the same kind of thing it's just you know it feels 
to them kind of this sense of uh, more compact. And it's just that much more important for us to take care of it. And so that's kind of the sense of things. And they got some amazing cameras in space and everything. So I'm really excited about this series. Um, yeah, so this that is kind of cool. really good. Mm -hmm. So that's why. So in, to help promote this, we got to go with these guys to Space Camp. And Space Camp, of course, most people know it as for, for kids. But now they have a corporate kind of space camp for adults. So you can go there as groups and do this kind of corporate team building. And so we did kind of the mm. adult um, space camp uh, type of, of thing, which is really isn't much different than the kid one. It, it's kind of funny because I don't think the adults, at least our group of adults, didn't act much different than kids. Um, but yeah, I got to post because, of course, I'm there with all my cameras and crap. Um, but we had a cameraman there, too, so a professional who's taken pictures for us. So hopefully I'll have some cool pictures like that to post soon. But, um, you know, on my Instagram and stuff, I posted me on that multi-axis trainer. Right. Um, where it spins you around. And it's actually not as barf inducing as you might think your center is the center of gravity your stomach is the center of gravity so your stomach isn't moving so much that's why it doesn't bother your stomach as much and they say as long as you keep your eyes open it doesn't hurt your head as much and i wasn't going to do it i thought i don't want to get a headache i don't want to throw up but i decided to do it because a lot of people said that it, it wasn't that bad and it wasn't um luckily i wasn't now, that you, dizzy mm -hmm. Can you control the speed of that? Or no. Do they, you can't. Wow. It just flips you around all by itself. It just gets going kind of like a gyroscope all by itself, and you just start mm -hmm. flipping around, and it's kind of crazy. Can you control it by flipping a certain way? Not really. <laughs> Not that I think. I, I don't know. Maybe some seasoned person could, but no. I mean, it's so large, and, and it has so much the advantage of your weight is is nothing compared to the rest of the weight of this thing um right. so yeah i don't think so yeah yeah I thought those videos were cool I so that was that. cool we launched mm. rockets and we, we did some other stuff what but, do you mean you launched rockets oh we launched like model rockets oh okay <laughs> so which was funny. And it was funny because we're building them and especially one table was getting really loud and everybody having fun. And she had to act like little kids. Okay, everybody focus, you know, and, and they were using like their little kid tactics on us. Back and it coloring worked. books. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. Wow. So, but this is cool. So this week is, uh, there's a lot of news today about uh, today being the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 mission. Did mm. you know that? No, I did not. Wow. Yeah. I missed that in the news today. Yeah. Hmm. So December, what well, was actually uh, December 7th, 1972, but I guess today was the day maybe they got to the moon because um, they're talking a lot about it today. Uh, they landed on the 19th. So the mission was going on in 72, and I'm sorry, 45 years. Mm -hmm. which scared me for a second because that's only a year before I was born. I was like, what? I'm not that old. So 45 <laughs> years. But this is really cool. So at the U.S. Space um, Center, they had a, uh, a anniversary dinner that we were able to go to, kind of a gala museum thing, kind of like the things that you see on TV that, you know, Bruce Wayne would go to, mm. uh, <laughs> these uh these events and it was funny because i didn't have dress clothes because i had to we just got back and i had to get uh, uh, early and i didn't wasn't able to pack dress clothes so i wore my blue s jumpsuit space camp jumpsuit um you know and there's all these guys in black ties and everything and uh, uh they kind of thought i was an employee because luckily the kids who are employees there wore their suits also so i just pretended like i was staff with them you should have, like, served, you know, served food on a tray, emptied yeah. the garbage, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I figured if somebody asked me for something and it was cool, like, to show them something, I would. Like, if they asked, well, what is this capsule? And even if I didn't know, I could have made some stuff up, you know, like. Push that button. Yeah, yeah. this this capsule is powered by a flux capacitor. <laughs> it uh, actually is a time machine. <laughs> and if you get inside, man. Yeah. But nobody did ask me, except for maybe to the restroom or something like that. But um, 
So in this museum, just to set the setting, this museum is cool. So you walk into this museum, which uh, they've got missiles all over the place and everything. This is in Huntsville, Alabama, near the Marshall uh, Space Center, uh, where they have Space Camp, and they have a museum there. Um, and it's also by, I think it's called the Redstone uh, um like this whole town is all defense and military type of stuff uh, hmm. because of the redstone arsenal there. So I think that's it's an area kind of like White Sands where they can test their missiles and, and rockets and stuff like that. And the, and the, that and NASA, which is makes it, you know, all uh, defense and everything. So you walk in and there's this giant Saturn V rocket. That was a real one they had built to do testing on that is hanging on the ceiling of this museum. Um, so it's a huge. A humongous. So you can see this on my social media. I posted a video at the dinner where you could see this. Um, we first, we got a tour of the museum and one of the engineers who worked on the rocket walked us through and told us all about the rocket from top to bottom. Um, so we were in the museum before that huge museum, and then they set up the dinner afterwards for for that night actually, and so it was really fancy. Dim the lights, and it's in the middle of this museum with you have an Apollo lander, you have tons of different capsules and rocket engines, and all this cool wow. stuff all around. It was really neat. And this is in Alabama. In Alabama. Wow. I know, huh? Interesting. And yeah. the kicker, this is what was kind of cool, is that the guest of honor was Harrison Schmidt, who was a scientist um, that was on Apollo, the Apollo 17 mission. Um, he was a, one of the first scientists to be an astronaut, because a lot of the others were like former pilots and stuff like this. Um, so uh, that was really cool. And this is a big deal, because... Harrison Schmidt was also into the paranormal, and he was a key to uh, one of my biggest investigations. And do you know what that one was? Let's see if Uh, you know, because I talk about it a lot. um, Well, I know you talk about the, with the religious aspects, but it wouldn't Mm, be that. mm -mm, No. mm -mm. Uh... I don't want to keep going, so I don't want to keep guessing. So, oh man, Dodie. Wow. Oh, the whole Paul Benowitz affair. Okay, so in a nutshell, of course, um, this man Richard Doty, who worked for Air Force OSI at Kirtland Air Force Base in the eighties, was giving information to this guy named Paul Benowitz, who is an engineer who is providing like uh, equipment to Kirtland Air Force Base. And this guy, Paul Benowitz, this engineer, said he thought he saw UFOs and, and stuff and was getting strange signals over Kirtland. So he went to Kirtland and said, hey, I think there's, you know, aliens might be bu- buzzing around your base. So Jody and this other guy went out to his house and examined everything and said, nope, uh, this really isn't anything that we have anything to do with. Sorry. But Doty then apparently returned and said, hey, you know, you're right. This is aliens. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a whole alien conspiracy going on. And started feeding Benowitz documents. The very first hoaxed fakes document he provided to Benowitz was one called Project Aquarius, which was said to be a project administered by Majestic 12 this secret group that oversees UFOs. And this is where the mythology, the, the, the story of MJ-12 and Project Aquarius comes from. These hoaxed, fakes documents that this, this guy gave him. How do we know they're hoaxed or faked? Because Richard Doty says he hoaxed and fakes, he faked them. He said that he did it, however, to because Paul Benowitz was observing top secret projects at Kirtland Air Force Base and mm-hmm. they wanted Benowitz to think they were alien and not really top secret so that he wouldn't talk to the Russians or the Russians wouldn't take him seriously and get some of his material so they made him believe it was aliens he thought then there was an alien invasion long story short he went literally nuts 
He was yeah. institutionalized a couple of times and he went crazy because he thought aliens were following him and invading and everything. Uh, right. In the meantime, I did a FOIA and I found out that there were a couple senators that Joe, that Benowitz had gotten a hold of and said, hey, Congress people, I should say, uh, that Benowitz got a hold of and said, hey, there's aliens and UFOs and I have proof the Air Force has given me this information. Both of these guys went to the Air Force. So uh, Senator Pete Domenici and at the time uh, a congressman uh, with the U.S. House of Representatives representing New Mexico, Harrison Schmidt. I just saw that. I just read that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Harrison Schmidt went to the Kirtland Air Force Base and said, what the hell's going on here? Why are you guys, you know, bugging this guy about UFOs and stuff? Well, Richard Doty was the one who was supposed to go uh, talk to these guys. And in official documents that I got from the Air Force, Richard Doty, Doty told them, well, he, he came to us. He said he had UFO stuff. We went and looked at it. We said there was nothing to it. And that's the last we've talked to him. That's what Doty told these guys. But mm. he was lying. And he even, yeah. he could, because he doesn't address, actually, I've never heard him say, address how he spoke with these guys. I got this through these Air Force documents. But, um, he says, of course, he was feeding him hoaxed information. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was really excited about this because uh, luckily we were working with the press person at the museum. And I asked her, would it be okay if I passed off my open letter to the Air Force on this whole affair to Harrison Schmidt? Because I don't know that he knows he was lied to when he went in and talked to Doty about mm -hmm. all of this and she said oh yeah that'd be great so she printed wow. it out for me um we had a press conference with harrison schmidt and then um she let me approach him and say and, and this is what i did i said uh you know uh do you remember paul benowitz you i'm this was a long time ago but you uh had approached the air force on his uh behest you know back in the 80s and he, at first he was like, he didn't seem like he knew. It. And then he was like, oh, yeah, Paul Benowitz. And it seemed like, I mean, he knew, he remembered the name. And he mm -hmm. was like, yeah, Paul Benowitz, Paul Benowitz. And so I said, well, here's a report I did because I don't think you got the full story. And I got, you know, I did a FOIA and I got some information from the Air Force that I think you're going to find really interesting. So here's a copy of that report. And he was like, okay, great, thank you. And that was about it because he was mobbed with people. He was the <laughs> guest of honor. So, you know, there mm. were just tons and tons of people and lots of press around and everything. Luckily, most of the press was with our group the space camp thing. So I knew them, so it was no big deal, but, uh, there's lots of local press. So then I, he went off and I got a picture with him later and I got pictures of him there. Cause I want to write a story on this, but, uh, pretty cool. Yeah. So I got time for a short comment, but we got to go to break in just a second. All right. Sounds good. Mm hmm. So oh, you mean a comment from me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> if you have any initial oh. reaction. No, I think that's I think that's great. And I, I just I one of the things I wanted to say is uh, Richard Doty is now talking all over the place now. Yeah, he's so been, we'll, let's um, get to that. He's been in a film. He's been talking on radio shows. Yeah, and, we'll get to that. Let's oh, do we'll that after that. the break. Let's talk more about that because that that's a good point. So. Um, you're listening to Open Mind GFO Radio. We're going to take a break here. If you're listening on KGRA, you're going to hear some commercials. Otherwise, if you're listening to the podcast, you're just going to hear a short musical break. So stay tuned, and we'll be back with Open Mind GFO Radio with uh, Alejandro and Martin.
Welcome back to Open Mind GFO Radio. This is your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am with Martin Podcast UFO Willis. Oh, I, I graduated. Yes. Thank you. You're no longer a banana head. Oh, wow. Finally. You're demoted mm. to the host of Podcast UFO. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you made yeah. a point about Doty. You're making a point about Doty. Yeah, just the fact that he's on talk radio shows now. And he was in a um, a Greer uh, documentary um, and saying really bizarre stuff, uh, well, talking about aliens, seeing yeah. aliens, and all kinds of things. That's the thing is this guy is a liar, and I've written this and I've documented it in, in a lot of things. He's changed his story constantly. So, for instance, he brought Linda Howe to Kirtland Air Force Base, the right. same Linda Howe that's going to be speaking at the UFO Congress this year so go to ufocongress.com for more about that but he brought her to kirtland air force base and then fed her this really crazy stuff unfortunately she believes she thinks that it was all real but probably some of the stuff you heard him say and and then he denied that he did that now in my interview with linda howe on this she said no he never denied yes he did deny. i've got records showing that he did deny that at that ever happened he said linda was a liar and then Jeez. he backpedaled on that because everybody knows whatever you think about Linda Howe, she's not a liar. Right. Um, mm. You know, even if you don't like her work or whatever, some people don't, um, she's no liar. And, and she's got a great reputation for that. So he eventually backpedaled and said, okay, it did happen. I did show her this stuff. <laughs> but that was, he started to say that was mixed. That was some of it's real and some of it's not. And then he starts with all of these crazy stories about UFOs and aliens. And he's been talking about this ever since. He went underground for the longest time. Right. Mm -hmm. Didn't talk to many people. But now that his story has kind of gained some ground from... It's a story I haven't dropped, but there's other people, too, that cover it. That uh, Greg Bishop, for example, uh, wrote a great book, Project Beta, on this. And then there's another guy... Um, mm -hmm. Wilkinson, Wilkerson, uh, wrote a book on it, Mirage Men, and did a documentary. Um, right, that, Chris that, Lambright, too. Yeah, Chris Lambright has done a lot of research into it, so that have kept the story alive. And now he's kind of resurfaced a bit. Um, he was a police officer with the New Mexico uh, the State Police for a while. And mm. this is why I think the Air Force really needs, and I really hope that Harrison Schmidt... Uh, picks this up because he was lied to by Doty. And we need the Air Force to say why this happened. Why did they let Doty feed this guy disinformation? Disinformation that has become the backbone of the mythology uh, when it comes to UFOs about the conspiracy and everything. Why did they allow Doty to do that? Did they not know that? I would imagine they would have to have known this whole thing went on for eight years and now that he is no longer with the o osi he's still talking about this saying he did this stuff while he was with the osi so i think the the air force needs to give some answers and hopefully harrison schmidt looks that over and says hey you know can see this doty guy lied to me or at least now he's telling people he lied to me i need some freaking answers here so that's what i'm hoping for right and uh schmidt is now 82 so yeah. Who knows how long he'll be, you know, interested and active in it. So at the time, basically, Doty lied to a senator, is what you're saying. Exactly. He lied mm. to uh, two congressmen uh, mm. at the time, and, you know, as a representative of the Air Force. So the question is, Amazing. did he really create all those hoax documents um, because he was told to do it? Or, as some believe, did he do it all on his own really wow. um that's the question and that's unanswerable hmm. most people even lots of conservative ufo researchers believe that he was told to do it and maybe that is the case um but oh. some people like john alexander believe no he was rogue doing this on his own and uh, it's, it's hard to say so i want answers to that but here's the other thing uh moving on from that uh mm -hmm. with harrison schmidt so when I was on your show on Wednesday while I was yeah. at space camp in my super cool blue NASA jumpsuit that they gave us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we talked about how it 
the big news is some of the exciting stuff going on with space is actually that there's a new space race brewing and it's another space race to the moon which is so interesting in the anniversary of Apollo 17 mm. um and uh, here's what's going on is that the Russians and the Chinese not that they've been referenced recently uh, in news that even just came out today, I'm not sure if you're aware of, but um, the Russians and the Chinese are have said that they're going to, they're planning on putting bases on the moon. Of mm-hmm. course, NASA and others have been talking about going to Mars. But as we discussed, you know, some of us were talking about this, how can the U.S. be happy about that? You know, how can right. we allow the Chinese and the Russians to put up bases on the moon and just uh, allow that? Because, you know, we haven't figured out the laws and the legalities around owning property anywhere. And, of course, who's going to have the most input on uh, who owns what? People who are already there. If the Chinese set up a base and they say, you know, we own this thousand square miles around us, who's going to say anything different? Um, well, they actually can't. I, I can, I can talk about that. But that's see, but that's not true. The legalities. But let's talk about this because this is interesting. Go ahead. What did you find? Well, uh, so when you were on my show, we're, you know, I was kind of like joking, saying that uh, why not uh, people should be looking if they're thinking about practicing law to practice space law. And then I started looking into it. And there's a lot going on with that, Mm -hmm. not just in uh, mining resources, but satellite issues. You know, there's a lot. um, And there's, uh, uh, well, to get into, you know, basically what we're talking about, um, back just before... Uh, I think it was 1972, there was the Outer Space Treaty um, signed, and I think there are something like over 100 um, countries have signed into this thing. That was signed back in uh, January um, of 1967. And But there's also the Moon Treaty, and um, that's kind of an extension of the Outer Space Treaty, which was actually called... Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States, which means countries, in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. That's the long version. Um, so basically, it's just saying that you can own your property. In other words, if Bob Bigelow wanted to send one of his budget ends up on the moon <laughs> and plant it there, he would own his property. Um, you are actually also liable for your property as far as any damage that you cause or any liability, like if it crashes to Earth and all that. Um, but you own just your property, and um, not you cannot own any of the ground itself. It has uh, there used to be like uh, an idea that of occupation. Of course, you know we were the first to get there, so we um, this. Um, you know, we could have like claimed this is our, you know, our moon type of thing. But um, but we're all in agreement that any celestial body that uh, we cannot have a, a sovereignty over it, um, which I think is great to be in place. Um, and I have a lot more on that um, I can talk about. But uh, as far as resources and the mining of asteroids and stuff like that. Um, but so far, I just wanted to hear what you, your feedback is. Yeah, so the the issue becomes uh, whether or not something is enforceable or whether or not some uh, someone mm-hmm. wants to stick to that. So, for instance, the United States is one of the worst. You're not supposed to have nuclear devices in space, but the U.S. has done it. They've had nuclear-powered satellites and such. So it's like it comes down to... Do the governments want to adhere to that, or do they just want to ignore it and um, do and what how they is it want? Enforced exactly, and then it has to be enforced. So that's the whole key. If China went up there, and even even the way it's written, the way that you talked about it now, if China goes up there and and has a base, then they're the first. What they get the pick of the litter, they get to choose wherever they want to put it. So they've got first choice. We want this site, you know. Then we want this site, and they can put up structures and things. So if we want in the game, 
then we've got to get there. And this whole idea about ownership of the land, I mean, it's there's other legal problems. Bigelow brought this up. So Bigelow's thing was, and this is what's really interesting because Bigelow plays a big, big role. As you mentioned, Bigelow's uh, owns budget ends. He's a billionaire, uh, started a space company, and now he's got Bigelow Aerospace where he's building these inflatable units, once on the ISS, and he wants to build a base on the moon, and he's working with NASA on that. And at this Huntsville place that I went to, and I've got some pictures I'll post, he has a huge presence. They have models of his units. They have several different, uh, they have a big model of his proposed base. So they have all of this Bigelow stuff, which was really interesting at this NASA thing, um, just to show how, how much of a partnership they have going there. But Bigelow has brought this up. If I put a a budget in, like you said, because he is, was talking about that at first. If I put a base up on the moon where I want to fly people to, I need to understand the legalities of the ownership of the land. Because I can't put a base up there and then one day the land be sold or taken away from under me. So there's so mm. many issues. But what he's getting at, and I think what that's going to lead to is they will need to own that land. Um, because they will need to, for legal reasons, insurance and other, they'll need to have a firm legal ownership, uh, you know, of, of the land underneath these structures. So that, that brings up all kinds of legal issues. Yeah, for, there's a ton of it. And yeah, like liability, like um, ruling um, mm-hmm. laws, governing laws. Um, oh my gosh, yeah, we brought that up. But let me, uh, just real quick. Move to this next part because we'll get to that because sure. that's super interesting too. Um, I'm fascinated by this aspect of it. But uh, so I asked Harrison Schmidt in our press conference. I said, uh, you know, with the Chinese and the Russians, you know, prioritizing and having a refocus and saying they're going to go build bases on the moon. Do you think this will rekindle a space race to get to the moon like we had during the Apollo period? And he said, it's already begun, Mm -hmm. which was an interesting answer because he said, yes, it is already, that's already happened. Um, Then we get the news just today. I don't know if you've seen this. I did see that actually, the six. The signing? Yeah, that that Trump signed a space policy directive just Mm -hmm. today that is reprioritizing uh, NASA to go to the moon. Mm -hmm. They don't explain why, and nobody's really (laughs) talking about the why, but the why, uh, why are they refocusing on the moon instead of uh, uh, Mars like they previously had? It's because of what I just said. This is the kind of the untold thing that, for some reason, uh, nobody's picked up on yet uh, so much, is that it's because of Russia and China. We need to beat them so we can get the pick of the litter. We can be the first ones there. before, And so we have a, a stake in the game. Uh, so China and Russia don't get up there and, and get a run willy-nilly because it really is uh, the Wild West. Once you get up there, it's the Wild West. But right. here's the other legal issue that is that you just brought up, which is governance. And this mm-hmm. is really fascinating because there's two g- races going on here. There is a race to Mars, and then there's a race to the moon. NASA, and this is what people have wrong. If NASA refocuses from Mars to the moon, it's no big deal. People are like, well, you know, we want to get to the Mars. NASA does not have much of a stake in the whole Mars thing. Mm-hmm. NASA is planning, they say, to get to Mars. And we asked, Did, is NASA still going to go to Mars in 2035? Sure. But all NASA is planning on doing is orbiting Mars. And they're not, they're so, uh, you know, because they're, they're, uh, their policies are guided by politics. They don't have a real solid focus on getting to Mars. So that 2035 date, I don't think is very realistic. The other thing is, who are the players when it comes to Mars? Private. Privates. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The private space uh, initiatives. 
This is the thing, though. If NASA focuses on going to the moon, what's good for Big... This is huge for Bigelow, because Bigelow is the only player. As far as I know, or any of the people I talk to, Bigelow's the only one that has been working towards a base on the moon, which would also answer the question as to why Bigelow and NASA seem to be so tight lately and that relationship only seems to be growing is it seems that and this is my prediction Bigelow is going to be the guy they're going to be like okay let's get one of your habitats up there ASAP and Bigelow will have the first base on the moon now because it's a government base a U.S. base it'll be governed by the United States but private industry, SpaceX, if SpaceX builds a base on Mars, the U.S. government will have no jurisdiction over that base. SpaceX or the people up there can literally create their own government, their own form of government, have their own representatives, and it could be that we'll have an ambassador to, uh, let's say, the Mars X space colony or something like that, or the SpaceX Mars colony. (laughs) Um, Mm. So that is really fascinating. And I think that's going to be a big deal because I don't think politicians are thinking about that right now. They don't get it (laughs) because at one stage they're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, I want to have something to say about (laughs) what they're doing up there. And they're going to be like, tough, you don't have any jurisdiction over us. Right. Yeah. As far as laws go, currently, it basically is what wherever you are from, that's the law you have to abide. Again, how do you, how do you enforce something like that? Exactly. And um, you know, it's it's really tricky. And uh, one of the questions I had in this whole thing when I was researching is, and I can't find the answer to. And I'd like to know if someone else is researching into it because there's all types of information online. Is um, if you if you um, send an object up in space and it lands on the moon and you're on the moon and everything, now, um, do you own that object um, f- um, from the state, um, saying the country of America? But what happens if you personally own that object and you launch from another country? Um, does it is it ruled or is it owned by the country that launches it? There's no information about that. That I yeah. can find. I mean, law is all about enforcement. It's just like with the the marijuana laws. You know, there's mm-hmm. laws in place for uh, marijuana at the federal level. They currently choose not to enforce those, and so they don't get enforced. Uh, same goes for like you know traffic violations. We're all speeding all the time. They choose not to strictly enforce those type of things as long as. We're being safe. I mean, it's all about enforcement. Um, So in that instance, and that's what I think it would come down to is if I'm an American citizen in America, then uh, they can enforce laws against me. You know, Um, they -hmm. can say we're going to throw you in jail because you broke this law regarding space and, and the moon. But if I was like, let's say, Julian Assange or something, and I sought refuge or uh, diplomatic refuge in a different country, then they wouldn't be able to enforce it, and I could do whatever I want. So, yeah, it's so complicated. it's It's really tricky. It's going to be fascinating, all of this, and how they figure it out. And I think we're going to have some interesting things going on. I think that, you know, I don't see... For instance, SpaceX or other um, organizations that build bases elsewhere being that compelled to hold strictly to laws uh, made by countries here on planet Earth. Um, And there are a lot of think tanks out there, or there are not a lot, I shouldn't say that at all. There are think tanks out there that talk about this sort of thing. And it all seems to be about how... The self-governance. These people are going to have to come up with their own government and their own way to um, enforce their laws. Oh, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, Also, I'd like to talk quickly about the, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much time we have. About four minutes. Okay, the Act of 
2015 that Obama signed in, and the law explicitly allows U.S. citizens to engage in the commercial exploration um, and exploitation of space resources, including water and minerals. And I love this part. The right does not extend to biological life. Hmm. Um, so if anything's alive, it cannot be exploited uh, commercially. Um, so anyway, there was uh, back in 2000, this all came about because back in 2012, the Planetary, uh, Planetary Resources um, Inc. was formed. Um, and that was uh, actually, you know, James Cameron had a part to do with that. And uh, innovator Ross Perot Jr. And uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot going on in space law. It's going to be about uh, mineral resources and extracting things from asteroids. Uh, again, they can't have, you know, they can take an asteroid and they can land on the asteroid, but they can't at this point um, actually own or, you know, have any governing um, over the asteroid. It's really great stuff. Yeah, really interesting. That makes me think, what about this? So, you know, on 2001, right, we get to the moon and we find mm -hmm. that beacon. Yeah. So what the if... The monolith. Yeah, the monolith. What if the ETs are waiting for the first Earthling government on another planet? And that's who wow. they're going to say hi to. Because oh, then we'll have waiting. shown we were able to establish, you know, a colony, a government on another planet. So their first words are, what took you so long? Or maybe go home. Yeah. E.T. go home. Hmm. How funny, wow. huh? Yeah. Interesting. So, so uh, yeah. Just just a couple of uh, quick things. I know we're mm -hmm. running go right ahead, out go of ahead. time. Is um, so if anyone's interested in looking into space law, the University of Mississippi, um, they have a journal. It was the oldest one uh, published all the way. It's been published since 1973. You can find out about that. There's also a uh, space cyber and telecommunications law program, and that's at the University of Nebraska. There's information online about that. And uh, in the Netherlands, there's university. Um, I think it's at Leiden. And uh, that's International Institute in Air and Space Law. So mm. that's all informa uh, information you can find online. Really interesting. Cool. Well, I better do my business. So that's essentially it for the show. I better do my wrap-up stuff here. Thank you so much for, to Martin for joining us on the show. The time flew. Oh, my gosh, as usual. Yeah. But, uh, of course, Martin is on Podcast UFO. Be sure to check out his show. And you can check it out live on YouTube, which is super cool. And then you can yeah. actually see me and what I look That's like. That's right. Yeah. And Martin. He's a good-looking fella. Uh, I don't know about that. But thanks. <laughs> With the, and you have this cool green screen background that you do. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention, though, is the UFO Congress. So we have a lot more speakers that we've posted. Uh, we're going to be posting a lot more in the next week. We have some really exciting stuff up there, stuff that people haven't seen before. We have a guy who just retired from NASA. He worked from NASA for 30 to 50 years, something like that. His name is Alan Holt. He's actually been involved with MUFON for a long time, and uh, he's also involved with some of our my other friends working on the scientific end. But this ought to be a really fascinating talk. He's going to talk about visitors being here. I think he believes in that. So really, really? Wow. cool stuff. So check out UFOCongress.com, and uh, you'll find out lots of updates and cool stuff at UFOCongress.com. But, of course, at OpenMinds.tv, you'll find the news that Martin and I talked about at the beginning of the show. Otherwise, I want to thank Caleb Hanks. Some people ask about the music at the beginning of the end of the show. That's done by Caleb Hanks. Awesome stuff. You can find out more about that at OpenMinds.tv on the radio page. And I also want to thank Systematics, who made the bumper music. Had some people ask about that. I don't know that he's making music anymore. He was a listener that volunteered uh, some of his music, which I am so happy with. But thank you all for listening so much. Sorry I hadn't done a show for a while, but we'll be back on track until the holidays, at least. Um, so until the next, next time, adios muchachos. Bye-bye.